Hi, I'm Sheila Black, and I'm coming to you from San Antonio, Texas, on behalf of the International Writing Program at the University of Iowa. And um, we're here today to talk about disability and poetry. And here's how the class is going to go. First, I think I'll tell you a little bit about myself and my relationship with disability. And then I'm going to read two poems, one by me and one by a poet whose work I really admire called Emmy Perez. And then we're going to kind of go through two prompts based on those poems. And um, don't worry, because I'll talk you through the prompts. But at the end of the class, the um, prompts and the poems will be posted on the screen so you can look at them more closely as you begin to write. Um, I know we're coming together here today out of an interest in disability. So I thought I'd start by talking a little bit about my own history. Um, I was born in 1961. My father was in the State Department, actually. So I grew up kind of all around the world, um, lived in many different countries. And the fact that I was born in the 60s is kind of important because in that era, I think attitudes toward disability were much stark, starker and more startling than they are today. Um, in general, um, there was a lot of negativity about what a different body meant to your life experiences. I was born with a genetic condition called X-linked hypophosphatemia, which is a huge mouthful, but it's known as XLH for short. And the symptoms of it are a lot like those of nutritional rickets. People with XLH are much shorter than the average person. And we tend to have very crooked legs and walk kind of with a side to side kind of walk a crab-like motion. I don't know. That I was often called crab-like to me when I was young. And um, so this was clearly what's known as a, a visible disability, meaning that when somebody saw you, they saw at once that your body was not like theirs. And what this meant for me as a child was that most of the grown-ups and the children and grown-ups around me tended to treat me as if I was by definition an outsider. Um, and grown-ups in particular tended to assume that because of my disability, I wouldn't be able to live what's called a, a normal life. I remember when I was in third grade, I had a nun who was my teacher. Her name was Sister Agnes. And she took me aside one day and said, I should strongly consider becoming a nun because somebody like me would never get married or live a normal life, but the nuns might take me in. Another time, a friend of my father's um, advised me that I should consider becoming a biologist because even a girl who wasn't pretty, like me, um, could, could have a good career in the sciences. And this kind of commentary, I think a lot of people with disabilities experience, and I didn't think about it too much because it was just sort of how the world responded to me. And I kind of took it for granted. Um, at the same time, even though on the surface, you know, I, I sort of understood that my disability set me apart in some way, in a deeper part of myself, I remember from a very early age, not really believing all these statements, um, not really believing that having a disability really set me so apart. Um, and I didn't really have the words or the terms to discuss what I felt, you know, to understand what I felt, but I felt that way. And it was a powerful feeling inside me. Later, um, when I became an adult, I began to learn about disability identity and disability pride and disability rights. And that happened really when I was well into my 30s. And I remember the book that I first encountered that really changed my life. And it was by an American scholar called Rosemary Garland Thompson. And it's a book called Extraordinary Bodies. And in this book, Thompson basically talks about the social construction of disability identity, by which she means that disability is not simply a medical condition or something to be cured, but it could be considered as a kind of political class. She said in the book that one of her goals was that a disabled body, meaning a body like mine, 
should move from the realm of the hospital to the realm of a political minority. And what she means is that when we think about what it is to be disabled, we can think of this as an identity that is formed by the society around us and can be critiqued and, can, and also that disability identity is an identity that we can assume the way we assume a nationality or an identity as having a certain religion or race or ethnic background. Um, one of her quotes that I really loved was she talked about, you know, her own trajectory from being a person with a disability, which when I, as for me in the 60s, was a very isolating experience. You know, I didn't see anybody else who had XLH. I never met anyone who had it until I was well into my 40s and they formed an online group. Um, it was a rare illness. I didn't see people around me or in the media who had bodies like mine. Um, so in some respects, my tendency, like everyone, I, you know, many other dis people with disabilities I've met, was to form an identity that was kind of um, a negative identity, like I could be cured one day, or maybe I'll be cured one day, or how good a job can I do of passing as somebody who isn't disabled. Uh, Garland Thompson says, um, becoming disabled means learning to live effectively as a person with a disability, not just living as a disabled person trying to become non-disabled. And that had a huge impact on me and made me really think about my life in a new light as somebody who has a disability, how would I live as a person with a disability? And how would I claim that identity? Um, and like many people with a disability, my experience of my own disability changed over time. And one of the dramatic things that happened in my case was when I was 13, um, I underwent a major surgery that was aimed at correcting my crooked legs. And when I went into the surgery, my legs formed an almost perfect hoop. And during the surgery, they broke my legs um, in multiple places, straightened them with pins and kind of metal rods. I was in a body cast for about nine months. And when I came out of the cast, um, I gained three inches in height and my legs were not perfectly straight, but they were much straighter than they'd ever been so far in my life. And this was a very, you know, dramatic moment for me because after I came out of the surgery and I was in middle school, which in America is when you're say between 11 and 14. And so it's kind of that age of puberty and awkwardness anyway. But in any case, when I came out of the surgery for the first time in my life, I sort of crossed over in people's perception of me from being a person with a very visible disability to being someone who could almost pass as abled or normal. And it's interesting to think about those categories that disabled was definitely put in one category and quote abled or normal in another in terms of the way that sort of middle school society was constructed. And um, the first poem I'm gonna read is a poem I wrote about that experience. And I think it talks a little bit about naming of disability and thinking about how, what is that identity and how does the person with a disability experience it? And the poem is called, What You Mourn. What You Mourn. The year they straightened my legs, the young doctor said, meaning to be kind, now you will walk straight on your wedding day. But what he could not imagine is how even on my wedding day, I would arch back and wonder about that body I had before I was changed. How I would have nested in it, made it my home. How I repeated his words when I wished to stir up my native anger, feel like the exile I believed I was, imprisoned in a foreign body, like a person imprisoned in a foreign land, forced to speak a strange tongue, heavy in the mouth, a mouth full of stones. 
crippled, they called us when I was young. Later, the word was disabled and then differently abled. But those were all names given by outsiders, none of whom could imagine that the crooked body they spoke of, the body which made walking difficult and running practically impossible, except as a kind of dance, a sideways looping, like someone about to fall headlong down and hug the earth. That body they tried so hard to fix, straighten, was simply mine. And I loved it, as you love your own country, the familiar lay of the land, the unkempt trees, the smell of mowed grass, down to the nameless flowers at your feet, clover, asphodel, and the blue flies that buzz over them. This poem um, is sort of a reckoning by the speaker, um, who is obviously me. Uh, where she talks about what her disability is, has meant to her and what she regrets or wishes to communicate to the abled world. I think at its most basic level, the poem is an effort to convey the way experience is viewed from, as viewed from the outside is not the same as how it feels to the person living through it. Um, at a basic level, it talks about how to the average person, um, having a body that is not like other bodies might seem like, you know, just this bad thing. But to the person who lives in that body, the body is their body. So they, they care about it. They love it. It's, it's what they live in. Um, and so for the first prompt that you're going to do today, um, I'd like you to think of something large and important to you in your lives, something in your life that you feel strongly about or you think about. And I'd like you to try to sort of think about it in terms of a title, like I used with what you mourn. Something like what you miss, what you wish, what you know, what you've lost, what you have, or you can just follow me and, and, and use the title, what you mourn. Once you have that title um, and that I, kind of idea of the area of experience you're gonna focus on, Try to name this thing as precisely as you can using physical details and images. Um, I want to say one thing that, another thing that has been really significant in my life is being a poet. And I love the definition of poetry that Wallace Stevens gives. He says that a poem is a cry of an occasion. He means that poetry is, is a, a compressed expression of, of a feeling or experience, and it really rises from our life experiences. Uh, the great Spanish poet Gabriel Garcia Lorca said that a poet must be a professor of the senses. And what he meant was that poetry doesn't really deal in abstractions. It deals in concrete physical details and uses those concrete physical details to make statements or evoke thoughts and feelings. Um, one of the uh, greatest tools of poetry is really the image. Um, and when we say image, we mean simply a picture in words. Um, so as you do this, 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 this exercise, I want you to think about going from images. Um, looking at thinking of images that evoke something important in your life. Um, the other great tool of poetry, of course, is metaphor. And metaphor is also something that kind of arises from or relies on images. But basically, when you think of a metaphor, what you think of is it's a comparison, right? In a metaphor, you're comparing something to something else. And when I use the term metaphor, I'm talking about both the classic metaphor where you say something is something else and also a simile where you say something is like something else. Both of those kind of fit under the umbrella of metaphoric language. So a metaphor has two halves and one is the, it's called the tenor or the subject half and the other is called the vehicle or the image half. So if I give you a metaphor like say, 
the road is a ribbon of moonlight, right? So the road is the subject. And the poet then says, ah, it's not just a road, it's a ribbon of moonlight. Um, and, in, and those two come together and kind of create the metaphor. Um, the poet Stephen Dobbins, who's, who wrote a wonderful book called Best Word, Best Order, uh, Best Word, Best Order is just a great book of essays about the craft of poetry. And one of the best essays in it, I think, is his essay on metaphor. And in this essay, he argues that one of the functions of metaphor is to heighten the, the subject of the comparison, but also to kind of build the reader's relationship with the poem. And here's what Dobbins says. Generally, metaphors are forms of comparison which serve to heighten the object of the comparison, make it more vivid, stronger, more startling, more moving. Another way is through the authenticating act of memory, which means the reader must be able to recognize and respond to the world of the poem, either through imagination or personal experience which further requires a certain clarity as to the physical, emotional, and intellectual contexts to be found within the poem. So in a fancy way, he's saying in poems, precision and detail, how precise and vivid your images are really counts. And that means how much you're paying attention or listening or thinking back on your own experiences. So what he really is saying is that the metaphor comparison can't be so obscure or private that somebody reading it doesn't kind of grasp what the poet's getting at. At the same time, and all of us in poetry know this, we don't want to use language that's been used so often before we don't feel it anymore. For example, if you take a, a metaphor that in English at least is a cliche, quiet as a mouse. Dobbins, you know, that's a pretty good metaphor in some ways, except mice in my life haven't exactly been quiet. But it's a, it's a metaphor that we've heard a lot in, in the English speaking world. We've heard that a lot. Quiet as a mouse in a house. Um, and so Dobbins in his book gives this metaphor in its place. Quiet like a house where the witch has just stopped dancing. Now that's kind of a more powerful metaphor. And Dobbins would argue that it's fresher. We feel it more because the image part is a little bit mysterious or open-ended. We, we don't know what the witch's dance in this house is really like. We have to kind of use our imagination to kind of picture this witch, whoever she is, dancing in this empty house. Dobbins says, when it is open-ended, he means the image part of the metaphor, it works like a symbol. The image works like a symbol, which in its, its simplest form represents more than its literal meaning. The witch's dance is not described, and while we may have some idea of it, we cannot encompass it, nor what the house is like without it, except that it is wonderfully quiet. So as you think of the subject that you're trying to name, what you've lost, what you wish, what you mourn, what you miss, don't be afraid to use metaphor if it helps you see, make the reader feel or see the subject in a new and surprising way. I think that metaphor really is the way that the poet often directs the reader how they wish to see the subject they're talking about. Uh, for example, when we say a road is a ribbon of moonlight, that's kind of a romantic image. But if we said uh, the road is a it, the road is a a flat landscape of yellow lines, the road is a a place full of endings. Uh, everything we say changes how we view that original subject. And that's sort of the power of metaphor. Those examples I gave weren't perfect. They were off the top of my head. But the idea being that your metaphor is where you really get to shape how the reader reads your world. And, and the image does the same thing. Um, we can talk a little more after the next poem about images. But I wanted to move to the next poem. I love this poet. 
And this poet, like many poets, is very specific, specifically located in a way in her time and place. But I think that one of the wonderful things about poetry is that the more specific you often are in explaining your experience, your world, in bringing the reader into your world, it's a strange paradox, a kind of a mystery, but the more universal your poems often become. Um, it's, it's as if by evoking a tiny moment, one often captures the whole scope of a universe. This poem is called Green Light Go, um, and the it's by Emmy Perez. She lives on the U.S.-Mexico border in McAllen, Texas. And the title is, is a kind of an Americanist, Americanism, uh, an American phrase that when you see a traffic light, it's kind of how you respond. Red light stop, green light go. So this poem is called Green Light Go. To be a disco ball dangling in a storefront window in the sun with a cage on it. To be two and three disco balls Downtown McAllen, spangles of sun and water that grow tangerine skins late February, pink bottle brush nostrils, buff-bellied hummingbirds, to be mirrors and hexagonal combs, Mexican honey wasps, larvae, paper, wax, to make geometry without vocabulary, to be live music, Take off your jacket, girl, wear your ta tank top, it's 90 degrees. To be a green light go, downtown corpus, after cars and trucks zooming on beach sand before hot tubs. To be an orange sun driving from Ansel Dua's grave. To be a cactus bloom, fuchsia, opuncha, laguna, atacasa, laguna madre. To be a watering hole a mud chimney air vent for crawdad water tunnels, to be a silver lizard run over by tires, a swatch of river on asphalt, to be a bolt loosened from the border wall, to be a peso falling out of the border crossings revolving slot, to be a Coke bottle dove, a Mexican Coca-Cola, a cooing quorum of lotteria cards signing a resolution. To be a goose perched on top of an abandoned sink in a yard in a town that fords the river. To be the woman stretched on her beloved's grave, returned after decades. To be a kid in juvie. To be her guardian, the judge, the PO, to be the letters she writes, the words that matter more than food, almost as much as music, and more than makeup. Nearly suns seen through the mandatory skylight, imagined by the control room monitor. To be El Chalan, the last hand-drawn ferry on the river, its ropes pulled by pilots. To be a passenger almost on the other side. Now, I know that at first glance, this poem may feel a little uh, challenging or overwhelming. There's a lot of words that are specific to the place, like Lotteria is a game that they play in Mexico with cards. Um, there's names of animals and plants that are native to the region. But if we look at the structure of the poem and what it's doing, I think it's really interesting and a great model for a prompt. Basically, this poem is a list poem. Now, I don't know if you all know a list poem as a term, but a list poem is one of the very simplest forms of poetry. And it's basically when you construct a poem simply from a list of objects and images. And almost inevitably when you do that, patterns start to emerge. The other thing that this poem does, and I don't, I'll just point it out, is that it uses a technique called anaphora, which is when a phrase or word is repeated at the start of each successive clause or line. Anaphora um, is a repetition, and it uses repetition. It's a very ancient poetic technique, and 
also rhetorical technique because it creates the feeling of a litany or chant. The minute we see anaphora and repetition of a phrase, we begin to pay attention and, and we're sort of pleased by that. Now the anaphora that Emmy Perez uses in this poem is tibia. So the poem's kind of an imaginative journey. The speaker is moving through this landscape. Um, she begins with, you could see she's driving in her town and she sees a store window with a disco ball. Those are those mirrored balls that you see over dance floors and sometimes they have cages over them, kind of gilt or, or you know, rhinestone cages and they spin over the dance floor. So she begins with this one object and she moves to list other items, things in her world. And gradually the poem begins to kind of form an argument or a feeling about where she's living. We can see that it's about imagining yourself into all these spaces, but as you read the poem, notice that it's really a poem about borders and borderlines and fences. Um, and the use of anaphora gives it a musical feeling that kind of satisfies us as we go on that journey. So the point I'd like you to try for this poem is, first of all, I want you to write a list poem. So as we've said, you begin with a concrete object, you notice it, and you kind of free associate through a list of other objects, which you can categorize before you start, or you can just kind of take off and see where it takes you. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to use this poem as a model is because I wanted you to notice that going back to Lorca's idea of being a professor of the senses, how many colors and, 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 and pictures and, and smells and feelings we get from this poem. The poem gives us um, things we see, also kind of evokes sound to be a peso falling out of the border crossings revolving slot. So we know from going and putting uh, coins in machines what that sounds like, right? And that's in the poem. Um, and so I'd like you to uh, think about writing a list poem, beginning with a place that you're familiar with, a place that you care about, and using the list to kind of evoke or tell us something important about that place. And one, another reason I wanted to use this poem is in the idea that the more particular we are, the more universal we become. I wanted you to kind of follow the model of this poem and not being afraid to be very specific and accurate in as much as you're able about the places in the world that you, you're writing out of, um, okay? I'd also like you to use anaphora that fancy word that means the repeating of a phrase or, or, or a few words, a word or a phrase at the start of each successive line or clause. And I think anaphora is a great way to build your poems because I found that once you, you, you try it, um, you often find it's a great way to establish a kind of form for your poem without it having to be necessarily in form, you know, a sonnet, a villanelle, a poem with certain meter or rhyme, but it gives enough structure that we feel it in the poem. Um, and then I would just like you to really let yourself do some free associating, uh, by which I mean, see how one image leads to another image and where it takes you. Um, I know that one of the things I've been talking a lot about in this is, is the importance of image. So I just wanted to kind of close with um, some thoughts about images and what they mean. Um, you know, the word comes from the ancient Greek imago and the original imago were little carved um, objects people carried. So it was the idea of tangible objects in the world having an almost religious or talismanic significance. And in poetry, we talk about images, but it can be sort of surprisingly hard to say, well, what makes an image work in a poem? What makes an image mean something? We all, we all basically have 
a part of ourselves where we think in pictures. And we all know how certain pictures evoke certain feelings and other pictures evoke other feelings. Um, for example, if I think about Calm Lake on a sunny day, that can be an image of happiness or, you know, relative serenity. But if I talk about dark pines in a rainstorm, you immediately think more of something melancholic or maybe a little, you know, worrying. Even weather and nature are the tremendous source of a lot of our image systems. Uh, fine weather, cold, heat, all of those things evoke different types of sensations. Um, a lot of what in modern American poetry, there was a movement called imagism. And the idea of imagism, which was founded by Ezra Pound in around 1919, was that a poet, a poet should be able to convey the meaning of their poem through the image alone. That the, the perfectly selected image would, would sort of give you the, the, the message of the poem. And I think that that was an interesting idea because it was, in a sense, a reaction against poetry that had seemed too full of empty rhetoric, the way politicians can be, you know, too full of big statements that didn't necessarily really create feeling or, or, or impact the reader. So the idea was that you would pare poetry down to just image. And even though, you know, as a poet myself, I do like to make declarations in my poetry and tell stories and do many things that don't involve the image. I still think that for me, most of my poems originate in this idea of an image or a picture. Um, and a lot of the, the ideas the imagists had about what was the quality of an image that made it work in a poem really came from the Japanese haiku tradition. Um, the Jap you know, haiku are very small poems. They have five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. And they basically are often capturing a moment where something is turning into something else. And the Japanese poets, often haiku masters, often spoke of a quality called sabi as something they really valued in, the, in, in images they thought worked in poems. And sabi means literally um, kind of a love for what is old or faded, worn, used. Um, it can mean a feeling of slight loneliness or desolation. Uh, the feeling of solitude we have sometimes when we're alone out in the natural world, that's sort of a feeling of solitude combined with a little bit of a feeling of awe, like we're in the presence of something much bigger and vaster and more long lasting than our lives are. And in fact, the more we kind of look at what the poets were getting at with their um, idea of sabi, the more we come to sort of see that what they're talking about often is the way an image can juxtapose two elements that suggest um, a kind of a kind of feeling just by their coexistence in in the frame of the image. Let me give an example. Basho said Basho, who was the great 16th century Japanese haiku master, and it's worth looking at him if you haven't. He wrote a wonderful book that combines um, haiku and travelogue log, and it's called Narrow Road to the Deep North. And I think it's available um, in many translations around the world, but he, it's, about, it's about a journey he took across Japan in the 16th century. And he, you know, uh, he has moments where he's describing his journey and moments that are little poems. And um, Basho wrote uh, about the a poem. He said, a, a poem, a sabi in the image provides color to the poem. The sabi is the color of the poem. And that if uh, the poet chooses images that have sabi, he or she has no need to explain what they're saying. The image will, will do the work. And Basho gave two examples of images he thought had this quality. And the examples were a very old man at a party for very young children. 
And the second was a pair of satin dancing slippers abandoned on the roof in the rain. Now I can get, grasp the meaning of the first image very clearly. You know, it's the, an image of time and the sort of poignancy of time. You know, the way the very old come together with the very young. The other image is frankly more mysterious to me, but in some ways more intriguing. These satin dance slippers abandoned on the roof in the rain seem to speak of something like festive, somebody going out to a party and the party's over. You know, like that feeling you have when you've had a dinner party or people over to your house for supper and then everyone's left and you're cleaning away the dishes. There's a, a peculiar kind of feeling of that. And I think what that feeling is, is the, the immediacy of the moment somehow set against something that evokes the scope of time. You know, the sort of immediate, the ephemeral, meaning the fleeting or passing, and what suggests the long stretch of time. And I think that the images that most pierce our hearts have a couple of things in common. They kind of capture that sense of paradox or that time is at once slow and fast. And they also tend to be images where there's more than one element. There's an element of movement or change. And this is something that the haiku masters who focused intensely on the passing of the seasons were very aware of. Often a haiku image is about the moment a leaf falls or the moment something blooms or the moment day becomes night. It's about change and it's also about paradox. So those are just some things to keep in mind as you begin to work on these two poems, thinking about how you can use image making and, and by extension also metaphor to sort of draw the reader into your world. And I We'll come back around just quickly to talk about that in terms of disability experience, because I think that one of the opportunities for poets with disabilities or interested in disability is it's a very unmapped experience in some ways. Like when I started out telling my story of my childhood in the 60s and people kind of writing me off in a funny way as a person with a disability or writing my identity in a box as something lesser and therefore not interesting. What that was essentially is what often happens with experience and one of the roles poets play in, in bringing experiences to life is that people tend to map, you know, erase what they don't understand, what scares them, what they don't know about. So in many ways, disability history is a history that has been in many cases, unarticulated, not written about, not understood, not entirely talked about within the broader, you know, rooms of culture. And that, you know, we can see that when we go to many museums and facilities built many years ago, and they don't have any way for a person using a cane or crutches or a wheelchair to even enter. So, in some respects, for a poet, that's a great opportunity because as a professor of the senses, what poets do is try to bring the full range of experience to life and make it palpable and felt. So when I'm encouraging you to go in and use detail and use metaphor, because metaphor shapes how we see the, the object, the subject of a poem, I'm really saying that it's a chance to map experience in a way that hasn't been mapped before, that it hasn't been mapped before. Your experience as people or poets with disabilities and your understanding of even the space of how you move through the world. One interesting thing for me as somebody with a motion, a disability that limits my range of physical motion, how quickly I walk, how well I walk, is to realize that in some ways, I have experienced physical space differently than the average able-bodied person. And the judgment of the abled world might be that I've, I've not experienced it or have experienced a lesser version of it. But in the, not, the disability identity way of looking at that would be to say, no, I've experienced space differently. And that's something worth capturing 
in, in the frame of a poem. So I'm going to have them post the um, prompts and the poems on the page just to read. And I also have a bonus prompt, which is part, which is an opportunity to join a, um, a, pro, a digital poetry project that was uh, originated by a friend of mine who's currently the Poet Laureate of San Antonio, Texas. And she put out a challenge for poets to write short poems and create digital postcards with the line, beginning with the line, my tongue is. So the challenge for the poet is simply to complete that line. My tongue is a flower trying to bloom. My tongue is a bald eagle flying through blue skies. My tongue is a box cutter in a bodega breaking down cardboard stereotypes. Those are all examples of some of the poems she's gotten in her challenge. But after you see the two poems that you will be writing, there's a third bonus poem where if you write a short poem, which I love this challenge because I think when we say my tongue is, metaphorically we can say so much about how we speak or what position we speak from or what we would like our speech to do in the world. Uh, just by completing that line. Um, anyway, there's a link. You can click on the link and find out more about the challenge and post your poems and join in the My Tongue is a Challenge, which will be a digital exhibition of poems from San Antonio and around the world. And um, thank you. And I'm returning because I think you've all written your prompt based on the your poems based on the first prompt on the poem, What You Mourn. And I'm here now to talk a little bit more about that poem, kind of guide you through it and make sort of to take you through some of the choices I made when I was writing it in the hopes that it might maybe help you think about choices you made when you wrote your poems or things you might do in the future with your poetry. I, I'm going to just start by saying something general I've found about composing my poems or about poetry. Um, poems for me often work best when they, in some sense, have an air of mystery or unanswered questions about them. I think that in many cases, poems work best in describing a landscape where several things are sort of true at the same time. They often look at the paradoxes or um, anomalies we feel in our lives. The, the things that, the way, for example, we might love and hate the town we came from. We might be loyal and disloyal to um, the values our parents taught us. The ways we feel these sort of points of pressure about what we feel we should do and what we want to do. And we, we kind of use the poem to explore that in hopefully generous and generative ways. And in What You Mourn, I, when I began writing it, I was simply trying to write about the experience I'd had of having this kind of major surgery that changed my body. And I didn't altogether know when I started writing the poem where it was gonna go, which I think is a fairly normal experience for poets. Um, one thing I found in my time, almost 30 years of writing poems is that it's a, it's a strange kind of discipline. You spend a lot of time thinking and learning about the craft of constructing a poem, but when you write a poem, you sort of do it with your instincts, your feelings, almost your body. And that certainly happened to me with this poem. So the poem um, mounts and basically begins with this real event, a surgery. And it says, um, the year they straightened my legs, the young doctor said, meaning to be kind, now you will walk straight on your wedding day. And weighted in that opening, there's the kind of assumption that having your legs straightened is a good thing or it's viewed by the world as a good thing. And what the poem in a way goes on to argue is that the disabled body might in fact not always have to be seen as something terrible or shameful or something that needs to be changed. And 
the, that argument really came to me in many ways through what became the controlling metaphor of the poem. And when we speak about a controlling metaphor, what we mean is a metaphor, not necessarily a single line, but a sort of comparison within the poem that becomes the comparison that drives the subject matter or the shape of the poem. And the comparison in what you mourn um, comes in um, really in the end of the second stanza. But what he could not imagine is how even on my wedding day, I would arch back and wonder about that body I had before I was changed. How I would have nested in it, made it my home, how I repeated his words when I wished to stir up my native anger, feel like the exile I believed I was, imprisoned in a foreign body, like a person imprisoned in a foreign land, forced to speak a strange tongue, heavy in the mouth, a mouthful of stones. So you see that comparison start to mount. And one of the things you can think about exploring in your own work is that when we're taught metaphor in school, we often think of it as a very direct comparison, like the one I gave you in the original le lesson, the road like a ribbon of moonlight. But often in a poem, what happens is metaphors begin to build on each other or, or you can extend a metaphor um, over several lines or even a whole poem, which is sort of what happens here. We begin to see this idea of the body as a home, right? And so the first word that kind of signals that is, I would have nested in it like a bird in the nest and then made it my home. So I would have been in it, it would have become my home. And then the next word we get is native. And that immediately starts to evoke this whole landscape of country, nationality, loyalty, that I think is important to the poem. And I think is the leap the poem makes, which is to say that this disabled body is in a sense a country with all the things that a country evokes, like um, customs, habits, experiences, rituals, traditions. Um, and then that comparison becomes more overt. The argument made is that this surgery, which straightens the body, feels to the speaker like being made an exile from herself. She can't help thinking back about the body she had before. So the implicit comparison is this change in the body reads to me like the change someone makes when they leave their homeland and they go to a different country with new customs, new habits, new you know, ways of being. So the implicit comparison being made is that between the disabled world and the abled world, it isn't simply a medical question, it's a, it's a social question. It's a question of value and understanding. And that gets centered around language. Forced to speak a strange tongue, heavy in the mouth, a mouthful of stones. And I think that in some ways that for me personally, was one of, this poem, interestingly enough, was one of the first poems I ever wrote. I wrote it a long time ago and it still, you know, gets reprinted and talked about, which is interesting to me because it feels in some ways very far away from me. But I think that it was one of the first poems in which I really directly tried to tackle my disability identity personally. And what I kind of uncovered about it was a feeling that in some ways, it had been like a country, an identity. It had shaped me and in ways that the world outside did not recognize. That's where the sort of imaginative leap of comparing it to the experiences of somebody who has to emigrate or is exiled came into play. It was to move from being visibly disabled to supposedly able to function as abled meant sort of adopting a completely different perspective and even a different way of expressing myself or understanding myself. And in the context of the poem, it's an exile I don't particularly want. And that's why the poem then goes into the whole subject of 
how are people with disabilities named? Um, and it's interesting for many people now, the word crippled is an immediate, you know, it's a word people don't like to use or have used about them. But when I was a child, I was definitely called a cripple. That was kind of the term. And then the term became disabled. And now people sometimes say differently abled. And all of these terms have their, their reasons and their issues. But what's really interesting is what's behind them. The compulsion to name somebody or name something and what that says about how we actually relate or view um, each other. The poem then goes into, I think, a more lyric kind of exploration. And by lyric, I mean kind of um, associative, imaginative, personal, about what it, what it would be to think of disability as a kind of country or my body as a kind of country. And I think that those sort of imaginative, associative, metaphoric explorations are often where poems uncover for the reader and the writer um, sort of the thoughts and feelings that are often truest to an experience. And um, it's, it's something where I think thinking about how metaphor springs out of things of the world, sensations, details, really matters. I guess I would just note that I give myself a lot of freedom to rotate between um, the idea of the body moving and the idea of what a landscape looks or feels like. I don't know why I picked the flower Ashfidel, but it's a, sort of a beautiful early spring flower. And the blue flies felt important to me in the end because in some ways, um, part of what I was trying to say wasn't that disability was like wonderful or that the country I was was amazing, but just that it was real. It had flies and it, you know, the, the, the experience of disability deserves to be paid attention to simply because it is. And like a landscape, it contains lots of things within it. And that identity can't be summed up by a slogan or a name, a one word name. And I think that that was kind of what I was moving toward with this poem. I think that the lessons I, I, or the ideas you might take from it are what is possible by extending a comparison? I, we, again, going back to that idea of metaphor, not thinking of metaphor as just a formula, but thinking of it as a space you enter and the ways that you can extend and grow and explore your comparison to reflect things about your experience. Um, I think that's kind of a good way to think about going about it. I also wanted to just close with a couple of ideas about form, because I know that many of us, when we're starting out writing poetry, think of poetry in, um, in terms of form. You know, we learn about the sonnet or the villanelle or that poems must rhyme. And certainly there's an awful lot a poet can do by forcing themselves into a particular form or by trying to adhere to it particular form, because form gives you a couple of things that are very important in poetry. One is the, the need to compress. I, I think I've mentioned that a couple of times, but I think that one of the great gifts poetry gives us is that it's a means by which we say large, important things in a relatively small amount of space. Uh, one of my favorite descriptions of poetry is by Osip Mandelstam, the Russian poet who disappeared in the gulag um, in the 30s. And Osip Mandelstam said, a poem is a message in a bottle, destination anyone in the world. And I love that image because it suggests something small that can talk across space and time. And I think as poets, it's always wonderful for us to remember that. So compression can be generated by form, but many modern poems do not necessarily rhyme, though I think poetry always pays attention to um, 
sound. You always are thinking what, you know, about how words play off each other. You might use slant rhymes, you might use alliteration, but in some way you're thinking about the sound of the poem. Um, but it, I, I think that when you think about the form of your poem, you think about, if, if you're not using a formal form, you're still thinking about your line breaks, where a line ends, and you, you know, the general rule is kind of that you don't generally want to end on a preposition. You often, if you are going to um, enjam your lines, which means you're not ending them at the point when they would grammatically end, you may want to think about breaking them at dramatic moments or at moments when you want the reader to pause. Those are all things you start to sort of think about. Um, the other way you often think about form and f is, is I think you could think about it organically. Like what is the form um, that you want your thoughts to take and how it does that form reflect the point you're trying to make. For example, if you look at what you mourn, the stanza break happens at a moment of intense emotion. And then the reader in the second stanza, the speaker goes back and begins to speak about the subject in a different way. So that break gave that sort of high dramatic moment, a mouthful of stones, and then a chance for her to go back and speak about the idea of naming and this idea of a country in a more sort of personal, sort of reflective way that I think serves the poem. Um, and the only other thing I'd say as you think about it is perhaps um, the, the element of surprise. How can you, going back and looking at your poem, think about the idea that whatever subject you began with, maybe you just set yourself the goal of by the end of the poem, you'd like the reader to see it in a slightly different way. Here we're going to talk a little more closely about the second prompt, which was for the poem Green Light Go by Emmy Perez. And I just want to say a few words about why I chose this poem. I know that the workshop we're doing is focusing on the idea of poets and poets with disabilities writing poetry. But I tend to think that as a poet with a disability, we are always concerned with civil and human rights in, in, in the broadest possible way. And one reason I liked this poem by Emmy Perez is that in an indirect way through images and listing, it makes a pretty profound argument, this poem, I think, about how we think about borders, freedom, constraint. And, you know, it sort of evokes this landscape of South Texas where the border has become increasingly militarized. And if you're on one side of the border, you're defined and your movement is controlled one way. If you're on the other, you're defined another way. And this, the, the whole subject of the poem is about sort of how do we pass from one thing to another? And she sort of enacts that with her list, which begins kind of charmingly with a, a kind of a frivolous object, a disco ball, and then moves by the end to describing a kid in juvie. Juvie is slang for juvenile detention. So the end of the poem is really kind of got ends with this image of somebody in a position of being constrained, not free. And then we go to the idea of being a, a riverboat, a, a, a ferry going from one side to the other. So the poem is playing a lot with ideas of constraint and freedom in a way that I think really helps us as we think about what are our poetic goals as poets with disability? How do we want the world to think about disability differently? And I was also drawn to it because I think people with disability often have a lot of experience of being put in boxes, seen one way, physically constrained, unable to do certain things or enter certain places.
which is what accessibility and inclusion movements are all about. As poet, I wanted to give this exercise because I think there's something really liberating and affirming about understanding how a poem can be really made or generated simply from a list of objects or images. So I wanted us all to try just giving ourselves that freedom. This isn't a hard form. This isn't a complicated exercise, but it can take you to all sorts of places you never expected and in really exciting ways. Um, the other part of the exercise I was interested in exploring myself and also think is a very good technique to kind of be aware of as you begin to compose your own poems is this idea of anaphora, which has very ancient roots in religious chants, litanies, prayers, this idea that something happens to words or phrases when they're repeated. They gain power, they change. We begin to explore what they mean in new and different ways. So I was interested in you doing two things in this poem, experimenting the pleasure of making a list and experimenting with the pleasure of what happens, how your poem takes shape when you simply use the simple technique of, of, of strategic repetition. Um, the other thing I'd like you to notice, though, is that with repetition, anaphora, and techniques like that, lists, you're often making a pattern. And just like music, and po poetry is in some ways very related to music, the exercise of a poet is in some ways to make a pattern, but also to think about the moments when that pattern breaks. There are a couple of sentences in this poem where she doesn't strictly follow the anaphora she set up. Um, and that's interesting. And often you have the freedom when you're writing a poem that basically uses a certain structure, you always have the freedom to, to manipulate that structure a little bit or to abandon it or break it. And that can often signal to your reader changes in the poem or information you want to highlight in surprising ways. So I will thought what I would do is just put up on the screen and maybe read to you the poem I wrote from this exercise. Because in this case, I too just acted as if I was one of you and I am. And I sat down and wrote a poem based on the exercise um, of making a list, looking at what happens in green light go and maybe using anaphora and maybe using emmy Perez's specific phrase which i think is lovely the phrase to be a very simple three words two of them preposition you know three tiny words but it kind of for me that phrase to be a to be a disco ball dangling in a storefront window it kind of implies this attitude of speculation, curiosity, longing um, that to me gave a lot of emotion to her poem. And I found that when I came to write one, I wanted to kind of preserve that. So here's what I wrote, and I'll just read it to you very quickly. And my poem's a little shorter and simpler than um, Emmy Perez's, but here goes. To be a dress hanging in the closet, waiting for spring and the first walk in the park. To be a shoe discarded from a foot, slowly filling with rainwater and grit. To be the hand clasping its sister hand. To be the start of a river in snowmelt season, a mere trickle and then a rush of white, green, blue, black to be the last leaf on the branch of winter, to be the smallest possible first shoot of spring, to say, I have been here before when it is not true, to be hyacinth, lilac, lily of the valley, to be oriole, bunting, simple bluebird, to be the person inside the house peering out at the other people walking, to wonder, if death is like having all the sleep in the world, a luxury like the cleanest never used sheets.
to be the tiny ants that spread across the plate of sugar. So obviously my poem really springs from a list of images. And yet, as we can't do anything without patterns forming, I think that the um, list starts to make a kind of picture or argument. And I think that you'll find that happening with your poems. You, you start making a list and before you know it, you're telling a story. In this case, I think that the story comes from really where I'm at right now. Um, like many of you, I'm in quarantine because of COVID-19 pandemic. And I get the feeling that the poem began with me literally looking around my room and seeing a dress I own hanging in my closet. And it was sort of a, a spring dress, you know, with flowers on it, a fancy dress that I haven't gotten to wear outside because I haven't been going outside. And I think that the dress started to make me think about spring, about going outside. And in a way that became a kind of metaphor for the idea that we're all in a time of waiting. Um, the pandemic per period doesn't feel like winter, but it does feel like winter because like winter, we're waiting for when it's safe to go out again, just as when it's a harsh winter, you, you find yourself waiting for the days when the, when the sun will come back and you can go outside without your heavy coat on, or in this case, in the pandemic, your mask. So that becomes a kind of implicit metaphor in, within the poem. So I, I ran with that because I love that feeling that we have sometimes about winter that everything is arrested. And just as in winter, we, we have to stay close to home. That's what we're doing right now. And then when I'd written the poem, I started thinking as I was writing, I had been talking to a friend who was going on the, um, the Camino de Santiago, the pilgrimage that people take in Spain. She'd done it a couple of years before. And she was kind of talking to me about, you know, the whole experience of going on this walking tour. That's a pilgrimage. A pilgrim is going to to visit something, to find something, to uncover something about their lives. And so I, I sort of imported this idea of being a pilgrim, a wanderer looking for something, um, trying to find a kind of enlightenment or, or, or truth into the poem. Um, I decided to call it the pilgrim path, thinking about how, because, and I think it's because I was thinking, well, as we live through this pandemic moment, we're all experiencing a time when we don't entirely know what's going to happen. And we are in the process learning things about our, ourselves, our lives, each other. Um, and so the last image of the poem, um, to me, feels like, it feels like the last line for me. And the line is to be the tiny ants that spread across the plate of sugar. And after I wrote that line, I thought, yes, I'm, I'm finished with this poem. But I think that like many um, images and lines we use in our poetry, that line is interesting to me because, you know, when I wrote it, I don't altogether know what it means. I think of the ants going across a plate of sugar as being sort of, oh yeah, it's spring and we get to go outside and experience the whole wonder of the world again. Um, I also think in some ways it's a faintly sinister image. You know, when I have ants in my kitchen and they, you know, come into my house and attack the sugar bowl, I want to get rid of them. So I wonder if in some ways I'm talking about the fact that to be human at this time in, 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 in the world, in nature, feels like a troubling thing. We're, we're all at the mercy of forces that seem beyond us as individuals. We're trying to figure out how we can act as a community against many things that are looming, like climate change, um, the problems of the environment, the, the problems in our politics.
So I think it's interesting that sometimes when you write a poem or you craft a metaphor, many meanings that you may not intend come into the poem, and that's really okay. Um, I wanted to conclude with one of my favorite definitions of poetry, because I think it, it kind of covers a lot of the things I've been talking about in this class. And it's by an American poet called Elizabeth Bishop. If you haven't read her, I recommend it. She's a fantastic um, maker of images that, that resonate. And by resonate, I mean they seem to talk about the the thoughts and feelings we all experience in our lives. And she was once asked, what, what makes poetry meaningful or what makes poetry good to you? And she said, I think a poem needs to have three things, accuracy, spontaneity, and mystery. And I love that list because I think that when we speak about accuracy, we mean simply the poem has to feel imaginatively true. And how do we get there? Often by using strong and interesting nouns and verbs, by being unafraid to use precise details without getting teacherly or pedantic about it. It means really thinking about the people, objects, places of our lives and that matter to us. Spontaneity, I think of that as coming into the music of the poem. Um, in the sense that we don't want a poem to feel like a lecture. We don't want it to feel so crafted. We don't hear the voice of the poet. So in some respects, when we go back to the idea of a poem as a message in the bottle, part of what you're trying to do when you write poetry is try to learn to, to be as true to your own voice as you can be. And that's, that's hard because your voice is not going to be exactly the same as anyone else's voice. And your poetry voice is not necessarily going to be exactly like your speaking voice. So I think that you want to do some exploring to uncover that. But you want to really be listening to the moments when you feel like, yes, I'm saying something true and I'm saying it in a way I want to say it, I need to say it, and trust those moments and let your style kind of grow from those. Um, the other part, mystery, is really interesting. And I think it goes directly into what I feel is the real power of image and metaphor and why they're so important to poetry. Um, unlike a, a statement, an image can suggest meanings but it isn't entirely anchored down to any one of them. There's always a little room for the reader to take that image and kind of own it. Um, and that is a real gift to poetry, that, that you are using images and by using images, you're letting your reader kind of become a co-conspirator in the poem they may see an image different or feel an image slightly differently from how you do. And that gives them a reason to keep returning to the poem. Similarly with metaphor, metaphor often opens multiple possible meanings or suggestions within the original object described. And it's a way you can help direct your reader, but it's also a way you can open for your reader a different sense of what that original object really means. Um, and I think that those things together make what is so significant about poetry for us, that poetry doesn't necessarily answer all our questions, but it helps us have a better sense of what they are and it gives us some glimmers of where we might find answers. So in many ways, Becoming a poet is much like becoming a pilgrim. You're learning to walk through this process of answering, asking important questions about your life. And I think that that's especially important for us as people with disabilities because the definitions that we have been given for what our identity and lives are and the forms that they're allowed to take have often been really restricted by social practice, customs, superstition, 
and quite frankly, the fear many able people have because disability is mysterious to people. Um, for example, I was born with a body that looked different from most other bodies. Um, I didn't even have family who had the same genetic illness I did. I was a mutation, that kind of sci-fi word. And so I was the first person in my family to be born with XLH. And there was a feeling that the mystery of this tends to be viewed by most people, mysterious things, things people don't quite understand, tend to be viewed with superstition, fear, and that sometimes translates into prejudice and hate. And yet, in fact, in some ways, disability is a sign of the remarkable vitality and variation of our bodies and our lives and our experiences. And it's not surprising to me that many people with disabilities have turned to poetry and the arts because at their best, that's exactly what the arts do. They say, this was my experience. This is how it felt. This is what it meant to me. Um, when Wallace Stevens says, poetry is in a cry of an, the cry of an occasion, that's what he means. Um, and when we think of poetry as something that teaches you, shows you, makes you feel something, um, we're what it makes you feel is really the infinite variety of human experience, that the world is large and full of wonders. Thank you. <laughs> um, and last but not least, um, I hope you have a good time writing these poems. And I hope that you'll also think about various ways you might incorporate modeling your work on, on work you admire can expand your practice as a poet. Um, I still find that if I, you know, I gain a lot from experimenting, not just with form, but with looking at the poems of poets I admire and trying to do something similar. Um, it often teaches me a lot about how, how language works, how my own process works, and new ideas and techniques I can take. Thank you. <laughs>